Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to continue continue our study of nuclear reactions. And we're going to talk about nuclear equations. So as we looked at chemical reactions, and how we can describe those with chemical equations, we're now going to look at nuclear reactions, and see how those can be described in an equation form. So first of all, we want to look at the types of particles that are involved. So if we want to remember that nuclear reactions involve changes in atomic numbers and mass numbers, or the energy states of the nuclei. So they are all changes within the nucleus of the atom. So we're not generally talking about electrons here, which is what we looked at for chemical reactions. So common are protons, which would be written as shown here, neutrons. And when we're looking at these numbers, again, we're looking at the mass number at the top, the uh, the atomic number at the bottom and the element or the compound that we're looking at. So with the subscript and a superscript of both one with a lowercase p would be a proton. A neutron would have a superscript of one a subscript of zero preceding the lowercase n for neutron. Alpha particles are helium nuclei, so they'd be written as HE for helium. And prior to that, you would see a superscript of four and a subscript of two. A beta particle can either be an electron or which is written with an E. Sometimes it's also written with the Greek letter beta for beta particle, but an, a beta particle is actually an electron. And we can also see positrons, which are the similar to electrons, except they have the opposite charge. So they will have either a minus one or a plus one here, showing the charge that is present. Now, when we want to look at these, we want to look at the different types of nuclear reactions. We have alpha decay, beta decay, gamma decay, and then we have positron emission or electron capture. And what we remember is that all of these change the nucleus in some way. Now the one that gives uh, the least change at least in terms of compounds is the gamma decay. If we note there the atomic number and the atomic mass are both unchanged. We have ch changed the state of the electron uh, of the sorry of the nucleus but we have not changed the actual numbers. In other cases, we can have alpha decay. Alpha decay takes some element and that element ejects out an alpha particle or a helium nucleus and leaves behind a new element. And in this case, the atomic number will decrease by two. The mass will decrease by four, giving us a completely different element. For beta decay, we eject an electron from the nucleus. So that event essentially turns a neutron into a proton to keep the charge the same. And what that is going to do is not change the mass. The mass will remain the same, but the atomic number will increase by one because we have added one proton to the nucleus. One of those neutrons was converted into a proton. Now we can also emit a positron from the nucleus. If we do that, we are now changing a proton into a neutron. So a electron comes out again to balance the charge. We're losing a positive charge when that positron comes out. And therefore, it's the opposite of a beta decay. Again, the mass remains unchanged, but the atomic number will decrease by one. And then finally, we can actually capture an electron as well. In those cases, an electron is captured, and that will take a proton and convert it into a neutron. And you can imagine that it's a similar state that to a positron emission, it does exactly the same thing uh, in terms of how the atomic mass remains unchanged, and the atomic number decreases by one. In both of these cases, we are converting a proton into a neutron. 
Now we want to look at a little bit about what a positron is and a positron is actually an example of antimatter. It's exactly like an electron but has a positive charge. Now we know when matter and antimatter come together, they will annihilate each other and convert into pure energy. The matter disappears and the mass is converted to energy and the amount is given by Einstein's equation E equals mc squared, where c is the speed of light. So a very small amount of mass can give you a large amount of energy. So when matter and mat matter and antimatter meet, what happens is shown here where we have an electron and a positron, one with a negative charge and one with a positive charge. They combine together, giving off a couple of gamma rays, which are very high energy electromagnetic radiation, as you may recall from our section on physics. So as we look at these, these tell us uh, this is actually a piece of antimatter. And we're going to use those often when we look at nuclear reactions. Now in order to balance a nuclear reaction, we do something similar to what we had in chemical reactions. In a chemical reaction, we need to keep the number of each atom exactly the same. So if we had five hydrogen atoms going in, we had to have five hydrogen atoms coming out. Now in this case, we do not need this, but there are still two things uh, that we have to balance. And we have to remember it's the number of nucleons that remains the same. So we can change that we can actually change the types of atoms. So what goes in will not be the same type of atom that comes out. So it's different than balancing a chemical equation. And there are two things to balance because we have different things that are conserved, including mass and charge. So the sum of the mass numbers must be the same. So whatever comes in in terms of the products, we must get the same answer for the reactants. And the charge much must be conserved and that the charge of the products is the same of the sum of the charges of the reactants. So these are the two things that we have to take into account when we are balancing a nuclear equation. And let's go ahead and take a look at an example of this. And we're going to look at the reaction of magnesium 25. And we're going to bombard it with an alpha particle. So we're going to take magnesium and bombard it with alpha particles. And we're going to see what would come out. And we're given that it will yield a proton and some other element. And we're trying to find what is that new element that is produced. It will not be magnesium. So we're going to find we have to figure out what that is going to be. Well, we can write our equation first of all as magnesium plus helium yields a proton, a hydrogen nucleus plus something. And that something is what we're trying to find. We don't yet know X represents the element. A represents the mass number. Z represents the atomic number. But we don't know what any of those are yet. That is what we need to calculate here. So let's go ahead and do one of them first. Let's balance the mass number looking at the top. And what we know is that the mass that goes in, which was 25 and 4, has to be the mass that comes out, which is 1 and A. And A is what we're trying to find. So we can solve this by saying that the mass on the left side, which is 25 plus 4, has to equal 1 plus A, which is the mass on the right hand side. Well, 25 plus 4 is 29. And 1 plus a is the same here. And if we subtract 1 from both sides here, then we find that a is equal to 28. So the mass number of our uh, compound that comes out of this will be 28. That still doesn't help us identify it, but it helps us identify that will help us with the specific isotope that comes out. Now, next thing we have to do is balance the charge. So what we're looking at is the same kind of thing. But now we're looking at the subscripts where we had 12 positive charges here, two positive charges with the helium. And coming out on the, re on the products, we have one positive charge with the hydrogen. And we need to figure out what the other one would be. So we balance these. 12 plus 2, that's the charge on the left, is equal to 1 plus z, which is the charge on the right.
Well, 12 plus 2 being 14 is equal to 1 plus z. And again, we subtract 1 from each side and find out that z is 13. So now we know the specific atomic number of this element and that will allow us to identify it. If we go to a periodic table, we find out that atomic number 13 is aluminum. And now we can write the complete equation for this, showing that the magnesium 25 plus helium 4 yields a proton or a hydrogen nucleus plus aluminum 28. So that then gives us the final equation. Now we've figured out what this uh, compound is. And it is actually aluminum 28 is what is going to be produced when we bombard magnesium with alpha particles. Now we could look at a few other examples of these in history and ones that have been important. And Marie Curie, one of the first ones that was discovered as an unstable element was polonium. So polonium 212 naturally decays into lead plus a helium nucleus. So it gives that off. And let's note that our balancing is correct here. That 212 is the mass number on the left. Well, 208 plus 4 gives us 212. The charge is 84 on the left and 82 plus 2 will give us 84. So we can see that that is balanced. Another example was Ernest Rutherford's, which was a first nucleide that was created artificially. So when nitrogen is bombarded with alpha particles or helium nuclei, it can then form an isotope of oxygen plus hydrogen. And again, note that the mass numbers are balanced 18 on this side, 18 on this side, and that the charges are balanced 9 and 9. So those always will be balanced on any uh, specific interaction like this. And then finally, in 1932 is when the neutron was discovered. And that was done by bombarding beryllium with helium, which left carbon. Now we have to figure out if we look, if we ignore the neutron for right now, we'd find out that the charges are balanced because we have six on the left and six on the right. But we have 13 uh, mass units on the left and only 12 on the right with carbon. So we need that one extra mass unit to keep mass balanced and obey the conservation of mass law. So these are a couple of examples and we can look at a couple of couple more. But note that they are all balanced. Now, this actually, in 1937, we produced an element that does not occur on Earth, and that was technetium. And that was done by taking molybdenum, 97, and bombarding it with hydrogen, but not ordinary hydrogen. Note that normally hydrogen would have one for a mass number. This is two. This would be bombarding it with deuterium, which is a heavy isotope of hydrogen. And what we find is that would yield two neutrons plus an unstable isotope, technetium, that does not exist on Earth. And again, we should see that everything balances here. 97 plus 2 leaves 99 for the mass number on the left. And 97 plus 2 neutrons gives us 99 on the right. And the charges balance as well with 43 and 43. And then in 1942, we looked at a nuclear chain reaction. And that was bombarding uranium-235 with neutrons, which then causes the uranium to split into bromine and lanthanum. So it splits into two other elements and plus three neutrons. And the whole idea of a nuclear chain reaction is that we then form these neutrons, which can go back and continue the process of bombarding of and causing more uranium to become unstable and to uh, continue that chain reaction. So this was the first controlled chain reaction. And again, I challenge you go ahead and add up those numbers and make sure that the charges balance. You should get 92 uh, 
the right hand side and you should get 236 for the mass number so they have to completely balance there to have a balanced nuclear equation notice how we do use coefficients much as we used coefficients when we balanced chemical equations when we had multiple numbers of a specific element so let's go ahead and finish up with our summary and what we've looked at in this lecture is that the particles in the nuclear reactions include nucleons protons and neutrons but we can also consider alpha particles which are helium nuclei and as well as electrons and positrons and remember that positrons are an electron with a positive charge and are a piece of antimatter. Now nuclear reactions are balanced by balancing the mass number and the electrical charge of the reactants in the products. So essentially we're saying that mass and charge both need to be conserved. And then we looked at a number of examples of nuclear reactions that have been important in the history of nuclear chemistry. So that concludes this lecture on nuclear equations. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone and I will see you in class.